Good morning and welcome to this, the eighth meeting of 2015 of the European External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones uh, are switched off or on silent? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, swiftly moving on, we've got a packed agenda this morning, so swiftly moving on, agenda item one is uh, to discuss the Scottish Government's international framework. And with us this morning, I'd like to welcome Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs. Colm Imrie, who is the Deputy Director of and Head of European Relations, and Ian Donaldson, Deputy Director of International Division. Welcome back <laughs> to, to you all, to, to the committee. Um, we, we're looking forward to um, uh, hearing from you this morning. I believe, Cabinet Secretary, you've got a short opening statement. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Convener. Thanks for inviting me to speak to you this morning. I, I know over recent months your committee has been considering how the Scottish Government and its agencies engage internationally as the first strand of the Connecting Scotland inquiry. Um, I provided written uh, um, evidence on behalf of the Scottish Government to outline our international engagement. Uh, as I notified to the committee, we published uh, Scotland's international framework and policy statement and Scotland's action plan for EU engagement at the end of March. Uh, at the heart of these documents is the, doc is the commitment and belief that Scotland is a, an outward-looking nation uh, and that this Scottish Government is committed to uh, continuing EU membership in the European Union. Uh, the documents set out the strategic framework and priorities for the Scottish Government, its agencies and public bodies, and the wider public sector uh, going forward. And they will guide our priorities for specific countries, for regions, for sectors, and they also seek to embed internationalisation in all that we do. And I want to outline the context and background to these publications. Scotland's economic strategy uh, was published at the beginning of March, and it set out internationalisation of what, as one of four uh, interlinked mm -hmm. priority areas to help deliver the government's central purpose of sustainable economic growth to enable all of Scotland to flourish. And this supports the aims and ambitions, of course, of the First Minister's programme for government. So aligned to all of this, on the 25th of March, we published the revised international framework, which for the first time was accompanied by a ministerial uh, policy statement. Now, the policy statement sets out current uh, government policy priorities. We will update the priorities and the external environment uh, as the external environment changes. The framework itself is high level. It's a step change in how we collaborate the work across government, public sector and third sectors in support of our internationalisation agenda and our priorities, our strategic priorities. The framework itself sets out our ambitions for Scotland, its people, businesses and institutions. There are four uh, strategic international objectives. Uh, firstly, enhancing our global outlook. Secondly, strengthening our relationships and partnerships. Thirdly, increasing our reputation and attractiveness. And fourthly, engaging in the European Union. And our internationalisation agenda has to address two interlinked uh, challenges. First, uh, we must address capability at home through helping our people, institutions and businesses better understand um, the international environment. We must support them in developing the skills they need to engage, create and benefit from opportunities available overseas. And secondly, we, we must support the development of relationships and partnerships outside of Scotland to ensure that Scotland and our international partners flourish and the opportunities to influence global systems uh, are, are maximised. Shortly after the uh, international framework uh, was published, we then published our action plan on EU engagement on the 27th of March. And this sets out how we will protect, strengthen and further enhance Scotland's place in Europe. And our objectives under the European action plan flow from the international framework. And they are uh, being a committed partner in Europe, promoting effective, effective and meaningful reform in the EU, uh, active participation in the EU to secure investment, innovation and inclusive growth and finally strengthening partnerships with European states and regions and securing more jobs, tackling inequality, creating wealth are at its heart and the action plan commits the Scottish Government to promote the benefits of EU membership while encouraging EU reform within the terms of the existing EU treaties. And it's important to stress that while aligned to Scotland's economic strategy, the international framework is not only about economic gain. Scotland will continue to act as a good global citizen, promoting stability and equality and continuing our advocacy of human rights. And over the coming months, we'll pu uh, publish refreshed country uh, plans for India, Pakistan and the Americas. 
and we'll also be developing an international trade and investment strategy and we'll continue to look for ways to ensure our international development programme maintains and intensifies its impact. And we're also reviewing how we engage with our diaspora and the role of existing government and non-government uh, networks in promoting Scotland. And we're keen to broaden the notion of diaspora beyond the traditional sense to include those such as recent students with an affinity for a knowledge of contemporary Scotland. And we're also looking beyond uh, purely economic uh, indicators of international reach to include greater emphasis on cultural relations and diplomacy. And we also wish Scotland's relationship with our diaspora to be genuinely a, a two-way relationship. And finally, I'm sure that the committee uh, are aware that the First Minister's programme uh, for Scotland included a commitment to develop international One Scotland partnership, um, uh, partnerships and also innovation and investment hubs uh, over the coming year and years. And further detail will be made available as planning is taken forward with all our different partners and stakeholders. Um, as always, I will inform the committee as we publish uh, further documents and I hope uh, these brief introductory remarks uh, give some context to where we've got to um, uh, and also our prospects in taking the international agenda forward. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Very, very com comprehensive. And you ticked, I've ticked off the first two questions I was going to ask you because you've already answered them. So I'm going to move on to, to some other things. In your contribution there, you mentioned your f the four priorities and then the sub sort of a sections of that, part of that being relationships and partnerships. Um, I was wondering if you could give us any sort of a, um, practical examples of how that's been developed and maybe any examples of where you've actually done some work on that. And I know that you've uh, recently undertaken some work in the United States um, in building and reinforcing some of the partnerships there. Um, I mean, uh, the one thing to, to, to make quite clear is the international framework was, was developed by uh, a process of engaging with a whole range of different people within Scotland. This is not a Scottish government document. It's actually for the whole of Scotland. So therefore, in terms of business interests, but also in terms of the other aspects, i give you a very practical example from, from the United States is in relation to our universities. I mean, our universities are becoming more um, connected. In fact, uh, Connect Scotland is one of the, the programmes that they're working with across all universities and the funding council um, and relevant agencies and actually how we can work better in coordinating that activity is going to be very very important going forward because uh, as uh, I'm sure um, Kavina, you, as you experienced in the US as well the extensive extensive reach of people who are alumni from our universities um, you know has great opportunity for us and obviously in, in as individual institutions uh, universities might be quite protective of, of particularly for fundraising purposes not least um, of their alumni base but uh, what they're now identifying is the opportunity to coordinate some of that activity so there's also now developed a Scottish alumni um, program which is across all the different universities because there's a merit in identifying support for that that comes back to my point about you know the diaspora is not just about people who were born in Scotland who work elsewhere we've now got a, a, a tremendous cohort of individuals who've had an, an amazing experience in Scotland who've come from other countries studied here perhaps returned to their own country or, or elsewhere but travel with them a, a knowledge and understanding and goodwill towards Scotland and how we can help mobilize that to help new business starting etc so that's maybe a practical example and that's when we talk about the one Scotland partnerships in particular and that's not just about public agencies we've got to identify how we can uh, look at uh, mobilizing other interests but the first start has to be about how we better coordinate uh, our own public agencies when we're in country and obviously we're looking at each one will be different and maybe we'll come on to that but um, each one will be different uh, but I, th I think we have to mobilize all the, the skills and talents of Scotland of which education is clearly one of them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree with you. I had the pleasure to be at a Glasgow Caledonia University event in New York where there was alumni from nine different Scottish um, universities um, and, and colleges and, and lots of people there who either studied here or you know, have subsequently went and lived in the States. A very, very successful event indeed and a lot of potential there. One of the things that you mentioned was uh, you know, part of the relationships and partnerships in building our international reputation about securing jobs. But one of the key elements of that was tackling inequality and promoting equality. Would you mind maybe giving this committee some of your thoughts on the potential of um, any threat to the ECHR or the human rights um, legislation across the, the UK? Absolutely. The uh, Scottish Government is quite clear in its opposition to the proposal from the UK uh, government to abolish the Human Rights Act. Uh, 
embedded in our activity and in our international positioning is our belief in the importance of human rights. Now, that human rights is not just in terms of international rights, as we see in terms of um, security and the rights of people across the globe, but there's very practical uh, applications in relation to employment rights and to you know, issues that affect everyday life. Um, in terms of people's terms, conditions and how they operate. It's also about a sense of justice of the type of country that we are. And human rights has been very much central and part of our international development framework, for example. It's also very much part of our, if you look at our um, different country plans and how we approach things. Um, and there is a respect for, for Scotland and its approach in that. And that's, that's a, a value um, that could quite easily be diminished uh, by proposals from the UK to march um, this country out of uh, human rights agenda. Th thank you, Cameron. So, Jimmy, did you want a supplementary on that just, point? Just on that point, absolutely. Um, I would just like to ask the Cabinet Secretary um, to elaborate on the reforms that the Scottish Government would actually like to see in the EU. Well, we've uh, pre 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 uh, prepared and published uh, our EU reform package. We did that some time ago, actually, and sent it to the committee. Uh, we've been uh, very active and responsible participants in looking at what the last UK government called the balance of competences review. Um, and by and large, our findings, which were very similar, actually, to the UK's findings, that by and large, the, the balance of competences between the UK and the EU was seen as being um, as been fair and proportionate. However, there are issues that we need to make sure that we can try and um, reform, uh, particularly in relation to f a greater focus on practical jobs and services, that regulations, for example, must meet that, and that we should try and make sure that we can uh, improve the subsidiarity in relation to decision-making where we can, where it's practical. In some areas where competencies are clearly at cross-border, environment is a very clear one, where the evidence was absolute that, um, that by and large, environmental competencies made sense. But in terms of uh, that decision making, we, we think that there are practical things can be done and I'm happy to, to send the EU, the, Scot the Scottish Government's uh, plans for EU reform document to you again as I did previously but I'm happy to, to refresh the committee on our thinking in that area. And your papers, Jimmy, yeah. today. Yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got that document in your papers. I know, I just wanted to, it's also one of the questions in our papers too. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, Yesterday, the First Minister said that Scotland's relationship with, with the UK can't possibly be the same now eh, since it was before the events of last week in the election. Um, do you see an opportunity to, to review and refresh even our own actions plan and frame, international framework in that context to gain greater influence for Scotland, perhaps within the European Union and, and, and beyond that? So, do you look at our own plans and see an opportunity there to strengthen Scotland's position in, the, in Europe and the world? Well, what the plans do is set out what we want to do. That, that, that maintains that you know, what I've set out in terms of our ambitions, whether it's in terms of um, the economy or influencing decision-making the issues, uh, I think the, and the issue and the opportunity that the, the recent uh, results of the uh, UK general election provides us is with a, a, an opportunity of how we do that. And I think that uh, Smith's, uh, the Smith Commission is, is very basic, very cursory in this area, and actually there has to be a respect agenda um, that acknowledges the strength of Scottish feeling about the importance of enhanced powers, but also enhanced influencing. The Scottish voice being heard at Westminster is not just about Westminster, it's actually being heard in Europe. And we come back to the kind of situation that we had Richard Lockhead uh, was in Europe um, on Monday, again, arguing the Scottish government's position. Um, but also we're very, you know, very aware that within, um, within the current operation of the UK government, when we go to, to Europe, I'm due to be at the Audiovisual Council um, on, on Tuesday next week. You know, our position has to be um, an agreed position with the UK, but there's absolutely no reason uh, why we're there in Environmental Council, where we've got huge experience in terms of uh, the contribution we make on some of the energy issues and some of the issues I know that members have been interested in, we can and should lead the UK, UK delegation because of the experience and position and the priority interests we have in different areas. I think that, um, the, you know, that, that position now is unquestionable um, and it would be folly indeed for the UK government to, to deny that voice be heard, not just within Westminster, but also within Brussels. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues that have came up at this committee over the period that I've been a member are things like uh, negotiations on fishing, cap reforms, things like that. 
uh, post-study work visas, for example, are, are issues too that have been interest to the members, particularly in Scotland, and, uh, and also branding Scotland internationally, which is sometimes through, through the doors and auspices of the UK agencies and so on abroad. Do you see real opportunities there to, to, to develop those, those opportunities for Scotland and, and, and basically you know, take the opportunity to brand Scotland internationally a wee bit better? Well, ab absolutely, and that's why the One Scotland Partnerships will seek to do, as will the Innovation Investment Hubs. And also, uh, you know, if you're looking about promoting a country, you know, we punch way above our weight in terms of our, the influence we have. The fantastic year we had last year, 2014, gave us an enormous platform, as I think we've discussed previously. The electoral um, uh, experience we've had in the last week has also given a great deal of attention to uh, you know, Scotland and, and our interests. And of course, we have got real strengths in terms of our, you know, our university education, for example, I've just talked about in terms of our investment and innovation in certain areas, we are world leaders. And so therefore, branding that is very, very important uh, indeed. And I think it's interesting that in the work that I've been monitoring of the committee in relation to what other either nations or regions would do, there's a, a great deal more we can do in that area. And I think it would be foolish of the UK government not to recognise the, uh, the calling card strengths that the Scottish brand has. Um, and, but we have to make sure that we mobilise all the resources we have. And, you know, and, and until such time as we have uh, full control of the resources we might need to do that, we will have to work and will work constructively and in partnership with our UK colleagues, whether it's in the FCO, UKTI or whoever. Um, final question in this committee. Just looking more locally in Scotland, Cabinet Secretary, uh, later on we'll hear from someone from the West of Scotland European Forum. I'm wondering how our action plans and strategies at a national level for Scotland um, impact on local organisations across Scotland, for example, the West of Scotland European Forum, and how, how they would develop and work with the Scottish Government to take forward this agenda locally. My colleagues might tell me if they were involved practically in the um, development of the, the framework, but part of what we did was in producing the framework was to try and produce a strategic document that everybody who was facing, outward facing across Scotland, whether it's in that particular partnership or indeed um, uh, other agencies could know, well actually we're all pulling in the same direction and it's also about the networking that we can do within that and you know, we can, there's always more to do, whether it's um, public agencies working uh, in the international space, or importantly, and, and the international framework um, identifies this, part of our uh, internationalisation agenda is getting equipped domestically to be able to work better together. Um, it's been, been creating the, um, one, the appetite, uh, but also the networks at home, not just abroad, abroad. And that's where I think some of the strengths of this focus and the expectations from everybody uh, will, will make a big difference. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you very much. Jamie McGregor. Um, yes. Now, the, um, the Flemish government um, point out that they use something called the Flanders model, where, where, whereby they, 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 they bring all the different aspects into one office. And um, I was wondering whether, um, to ask the Cabinet Secretary, uh, whether the Scottish government has given any thought to adopting the Flanders House model. Um, to ensure the international, political, economic and cultural interests in each location are linked and located in one building. Uh, we're obviously very interested in what Flanders are doing. I met with the Minister President, uh, President, uh, Minister President Bourgeois, um, in recent months. Um, and I think the Flanders example is interesting in lots of different ways, not least because they have a kind of five tier of uh, constitutional responsibilities between the different um, the different um, state aspects of, of that country. And in relation to uh, international, the idea of having the Flanders House or the One House, um, we can do that in Brussels in terms of our, our presence there, the different aspects, whether it's culture, economic, or indeed political, governmental. However, the, uh, the challenge we now have is how better can we do that? Our office in Toronto is a bit more mixed in relation to governmental and SDI, for example. Um, I'm keen that we do uh, have more of a coordination of bringing all the different public agencies activity together it will be different in different countries because some may have more of a cultural uh, focus some may have more of an economic some quite clearly is governmental space and um, bearing in mind we're about to go into spending review and budgets will be tight the idea of you know mass kind of changing things from a physical point of view in terms of offices will be a challenge but the point about the one Scotland partnerships that we want to evolve will be exactly what you're saying as to how do we can better bring together 
um, different agencies together. So it won't be necessarily be wholesale, but we'll, what we want to try and do is identify particular places to do that um, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Um, and I think there's great benefit to be had by that um, and bring that together. But that's a, that would be a bit of a, a, an adjustment and change for different agencies. But that, I think, is, a, is, is an interesting model that we've looked at. Yeah. Um, the Scotch Whiskey Association um, have suggested that more could be done to ensure that the SDI has an appropriate uh, well-resourced presence in new and emerging markets. And it says it welcomes the fact that they think, think that's, that's starting to happen, um, uh, particularly in um, places like um, sub-Saharan Africa and Central and South America. Um, is that happening? I mean, is, do you, what, what, what's the sort of geographic um, sort of length of your, of your, you know, of, of your, your wishes for that, for the SDI to be able to really help uh, something like the Scotch whisky industry, which is obviously something that everybody recognises as Scottish and, and uh, um, you know, is, is very important, obviously, to Scotland. OK, in, in different aspects of that. One, one is to say that when we're refreshing our... Um, America's plan it is that. It's an America's plan because it will uh, combine emerging areas and uh, Central and South America, not just the North America, US and, and Canada. So that's an, uh, that's an uh, indication of what our thinking is in terms of our, um, our government refresh of our plans. In relation to STI, I, I would actually cross-refer the committee to uh, the other committee of this parliament that's looking at this area. And indeed, I think it was only yesterday that the Enterprise and uh, you, uh, Enterprise Committee and Economy Committee has published its uh, plan. So there's actually the detail that you're looking for are in, are, are, it's actually been published by one of your own committees from the Parliament, which might be helpful for you to look at. But yes, STI have opened up premises and, and offices in uh, Brazil. Um, I understand Ghana and also um, in Nigeria uh, as well. And that's part of that development into sub-Saharan, you know, some of the aspects of um, Africa, but also into um, Central America. And indeed, uh, what I would say is remember in relation to some of our energy interests, if you look at Mexico, for example, uh, we had the president President of Mexico with uh, umpteen different ministers came to, 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 to the UK and specifically wanted to have an event in Aberdeen because they wanted to meet with the industries, not just the um, producers, but also the kind of, uh, particularly in relation to the oil services industry. So again, STI very, very strongly um, involved in that activity and the follow-up to that activity, I met with the, the ministers um, and as part of the Scottish Government's reception for them um, and the event they held in Aberdeen. So again, looking at that's very practical examples of where that's already happening um, but one of the big challenges we have is the Scottish whisky industry for example is well financed it's uh, gone through some challenges I think in terms of export figures um, in, in the most recent times but the big challenge on internationalisation is not necessarily the large companies that have successfully promoted themselves. It's the smaller companies. We really need to increase, and that's what the other committee was looking at as well, was increase the capacity, and this is what the capability at home issue is, for smaller countries that haven't exported, because those countries that are involved in the export company, um, e export markets are more likely to innovate, and if you innovate, that's obviously going to be a kind of success factor for, and sustainability going forward. So the answer is yes, not just the Scottish Whiskey Association to help promote their activity um, overseas, but also for smaller companies as well. Thank you very much. Um, do, do, shall I, I, I've got another one, but I'll come back later. Right, if you can come back, Jamie Hanzala's got a supplementary on, yeah. on part yeah. of your question. Good morning. Okay. Just coming back on, uh, from Jamie McGregor's questions, uh, I realise that uh, you mentioned that you were refreshing uh, the Americas uh, in terms of a representation, but I was wanting to ask a more general question that currently we have offices or representations in various countries uh, dotted around the world and, and, and it's, I think, primarily based at the moment where we tend to be trading, um, but we don't have any cultural deep links in some of these places. And I'm wondering whether we intend to do that or, and also are we exploring any new sites that we want to have representation? 
Um, if you could maybe share some mm. light on that. Well, in, in relation to our economic interests, we're all constantly refreshing where we need to be uh, and our location. I've just given you a couple of examples uh, in my answer to Jamie McGregor. Uh, as you'll appreciate, my responsibilities are both for uh, culture, Europe and external affairs. And in, in relation to our cultural reach, I, I feel very strongly that you know, whether it's the, the, you know, using and deploying soft, uh, soft power, cultural diplomacy, the reach and range of what we can do in terms of uh, understanding is very, very important indeed. Um, Hamza Youssef, has, uh, in, the, uh, in recent weeks, has been uh, developing cultural connections, for example, in the Gulf states. In terms of the US, we've got a, a greatly expanding um, range of reach. So the reach is there. The issue is, do you have to actually have a physical location to do it? So, for example, you know, the National Theatre of Scotland, fantastic production of Dunsinane, toured. Uh, our American office uh, held uh, events surrounding their activity in Chicago. They're about to do it with the um, uh, Scottish Ballet, with Sheik Carnegie Desire and Heinle Fling about to um, uh, you know, tour or, or touring as we speak in the US just now. So the issue is, you know, do you have a physical place or do you actually make the most of the international touring? I've always made a, sh made a point, despite difficulties, and again, you know, a caveat this and you know, the pressures ahead in terms of budgets will be severe, but... Um, you know, in relation to international touring, I've maintained that because it is about making sure we've got that reach and range. And you know, that helps in a number of areas, but that impact of having top quality cultural experiences. But it's also about exchange. Um, so, for example, in relation to the Scottish Ten, the final, uh, the final uh, one of our Scottish Ten is the Nagasaki Crane in Japan, um, and the, the, the feedback uh, has been tremendous about the impact that offering Scottish cutting-edge technology in the digital sphere, but helping the heritage and understanding the respect in the industrial heritage, not just of our own country, but internationally, um, has an important impact and, and range. And indeed, uh, when I was at the Ryder Cup, I was discussing. Uh, the Nagasaki Crane with the Mitsubishi company, who are obviously major investors here in Scotland, and they were very appreciative of the work that the Scottish Government had been doing. Uh, it is, uh, one of the things I, I had picked up from uh, previous uh, evidence um, sessions that we've had in this committee in regards to some of the regional governments in Europe who've got international connections of their own out with the, their own governments, and I'm just wondering whether we will... Um, learn some of those lessons and have representations perhaps even in partnerships uh, in, in areas where we already have a, a British presence. And I'm wondering whether um, the Scottish Government then would look at uh, replicating some of that uh, just in a bit to enhance the, the uh, opportunity of having better trade and cultural links. Um, certainly in, in uh, potentially different, different areas. I'll give you two examples. Uh, one, uh, we've now, I think, had, um, uh, it's probably about now, about nine different ministerial uh, visits two ways with Ireland um, since um, the autumn. There may be opportunities there that we can explore in terms of the wider international reach of what we might do uh, in terms of uh, the, how we can uh, help promote uh, common interests. Uh, procurement was quite interesting, as I've uh, spoken to companies where where they've worked in uh, procurement across Europe, uh, partnering uh, in particular with things in the energy area between Scottish and Irish firms, for example, where the expertise of one complements the other. So that's a very practical example of what we can do and how we're trying to enhance that opportunities. And that's why we've had Irish trade ministers here. Um, I've been in Dublin. Um, the other example is we actually already lead to quite a lot of this within Europe. So the Vanguard initiative, which again, it might be something that the, the committee may want to get a briefing on, probably more familiar, the Eco Economy and Enterprise Committee might be you're more familiar with it, but very important to bring together, and my colleagues will remind me of the numbers um, involved of the different regions, but there are very, these are regions of high growth um, in, in, in Europe who exchange um, agendas, but also help drive agendas, and it's quite an interesting perspective. I, I met with a number of them when they were here in March, there was a major vanguard initiative here in March. I spoke to the, um, it was the Deputy Mayor from Tampere in Finland, obviously one of the areas where in terms of entrepreneurialism uh, enterprise, very, very strong. Uh, they want to work with people they see as like and uh, like-minded, but also in terms of experience, uh, and that's actually to grow the European um, wide uh, economy. And actually, interesting talking to European Commission officials, they recognise that sometimes it actually resourcing and supporting the um, um, the, the you know, nations or, or, or regions. 
um, can be more effective in actually driving and making better use of eco uh, the economic value of the money that comes from Europe in driving particular projects. And within the Vanguard initiative, Scotland is perceived as a leader in, in that area. Um, and you know, Milan's involved. I'm trying to think of the different kind of different countries we've got. Um, uh, we've got uh, South Denmark. Uh, Baden-Württemberg, uh, Sax Saxony. We can pro provide you a list of all the different Silesia, um, Catalonia, uh, different areas where actually, you know... Uh, Cabinet Secretary, whether we're actually hoping to enhance that in number, and if so, what are the possibilities of... I'm not sure it would be up to us to enhance it. I think actually part of it is people want to partner with people with yeah. areas yeah. of that, that are, are, are they recognise as key economic drivers of, 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 of strength. If you broaden it to include everybody, then you might move at the, the slowest ship in the convoy. I think in terms of the, the economic experience, it's actually you want to get you know the powerhouse motors of economic growth to be powering ahead and sharing that experience. But actually, make you know that that group has been um, selected in such a way that they can drive that forward. And, I, and I'd like to reassure you that we're recognised from my discussions I had in March as is actually a key driver within that. Thank you very much. Adam Ingram. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, going back to the international framework, um, you state that it will, um, we will seek to influence the external environment and communicate our shared interests through engagement in multilateral forums such as the European Union and the United Nations. My question is how we're going to go uh, about doing that, given we're a sub-state government, and uh, particularly how we're going to do that in the context of the, um, uh, the big show that's coming up with regards to the UK's uh, referendum or an in-out referendum in Europe. Now, quite clearly, the Scottish government has got a particular viewpoint with regards to the referendum. There will be negotiations between the UK government and the EU. Um, do you see the Scottish government as a player in those, as, in those negotiations? Um, on that second point, we haven't waited till we knew whether there was going to be a, one a, a Conservative government or indeed an in-out referendum to be arguing the case for continued membership and the importance of membership of the EU. And we've already been arguing that point, not just domestically, but also making sure that our colleagues internationally and in Europe know of that. Um, we've already, as you might be aware, produced the benefits of Scotland's EU membership, and that's already been produced prior to the results of the Westminster election. It clearly makes it more acute now, because um, clearly uh, the, the, there is going to be an in-out ref referendum. Um, we will argue this strongly the case for, for Scotland's outward-looking um, and uh, self-interest in the connections with Europe from um, a, a jobs and economy point of view. But it's also important to argue the case for Europe and its own merit as the cooperation <laughs> and the peaceful cooperation, and I've just been talking about the opportunities for economic growth, we're working in partners, you couldn't be able to do all these partnerships that we've just been talking about in relation to um, whether it's the Vanguard Initiative or others, um, where we're not um, so fully participant in, in, in the EU. So it's bringing it down again to jobs and services, protections of basic human rights, which are as much to do with employment as it is to do with uh, the international rights of, of those um, seeking help internationally. So therefore, uh, that, that, that that is very essential. The UK government has already has already conceded and acknowledged the importance of the Scottish voice in relation to um, reform of the European Union. That's why they invited us to take part in the Balance of Competencies review. That's why we also, uh, in our participation constructively of that, have already provided an evidence base as to what we think um, can be improved and indeed what should remain the same. Clearly, uh, I think the ambitions of the UK government to have treaty change will be uh, under um, great scrutiny and uh, the capability of doing that, I think, will be very challenging indeed. Um, and in terms of the uh, position that's put forward, and of course we have to have a role and a voice in what happens in relation to those discussions, not just internally within the U UK, but also directly, so that our voice and our interests as a, a devolved government um, can, can be heard, not just by the UK, 
but also within Brussels. And that's what we want to make sure uh, can, can, can happen. But it's not something that is about to happen. It's a position that we've already been discussing with all the international visitors that we've had since the referendum, for example, uh, here in this uh, city, uh, visiting the government, but also in my international visits, which I will continue to do. And perhaps secondly, on international institutions, the UN, for example, will be also an important aspect of our involvement. A lot of it on a very practical and important basis, for example, on climate change, uh, we will continue to be recognised and position Scotland as a world leader in this area. But one where, in terms of you know, uh, UN forums and the opportunities to influence that, we will continue to take, and we've already been recognised at UN level for that activity. Yes. I think it's well, uh, well recognised that Scotland has got a distinctive stance with regards to the relationship, relationship with the, the EU, not least as a consequence of the First Minister's statements during the, um, the recent uh, general election campaign, which suggests that if Scotland uh, supported continued uh, membership of the EU and the rest of the UK, in particular England, voted to, to get out. That um, clearly has been established uh, amongst our, our various uh, partners in Europe as well. And I, I heard Mario Monte during the week in a Newsnight um, interview. Uh, and it seems to, uh, who, who emphasised that point, it seems to me that that will actually influence the negotiation between the UK government and um, and the Euro European Union, Scotland's stance in this matter. So should that not give us a wee bit more leverage with regards to the UK government and indeed the EU in these circumstances? Is that something that um, you're aware of? Well, you know, I've, I've made it clear that we have been arguing the position of the Scottish government in relation to EU membership uh, for some time. We haven't waited to, to find out whether there will be a referendum or not, because the merits of Europe have to be argued on their own point. But that also has the, the, the impact that you said that people are quite aware of our position. Um, I, and, and that may well have a, a bearing and impact. I think it's also, um, I think it's, it's, it's critical to say that the proposal for a double lock is something that's familiar to other countries. The idea of a double majority that, you know, should um, there be a, re you know, should, should the referendum um, result in a majority to leave in one part of the, 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 uh, the constituent part of the UK, but not in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. That should not allow the UK to leave. Uh, the, the, the point that um, the, the UK should not leave if one constituent part says we want to stay is not something that's unusual in terms of constitutional politics. Indeed, in other areas and other countries like Australia or um, Canada, or even if you look at the United States in relation to some of the constitutional issues in relation to its constitution, so the UK will have to decide whether it wants to remain uh, a, a country that has constituent and respected and equal membership of its constituent parts or whether it wants to railroad po uh, people's position against the will. Now, the case still has to be argued and won in relation to what the public think in terms of, of that membership, but quite clearly the self-interest for many people in, in this country and the common interest of European membership is something that we will continue to advocate and articulate not just within the United Kingdom but also internationally. Okay, so... You, the Scottish Government will be heavily engaged with the, the UK Government on this particular point. Well, we already have been in many different ways. All I'm saying is in relation to the new, um, the, the new uh, UK Government, uh, I have yet to have a conversation with either Philip Hammond or David Lillington, who are continuing in their posts, but previously in relation to discussions with them and positions, uh, it's now changed. Previously, the, it wasn't the UK Government's position to have a referendum because it was a coalition and one partner did not want to be... Want, did not want to have the, the referendum. Uh, it's now a majority a Conservative government, which is obviously a different light, but I look forward to my constructive dialogue and discussions continuing with uh, both Philip Hammond and David Lillington. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anne McTaggart. Um, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary and panel members. Um, a lot of what you've said um, and that you've set out within the international strategy and the aims that you're aiming to achieve... Can you inform um, us on how, you, how you'll be assessing that? 
Well, the, the government has um, established uh, an assessment programme, which is the National Performance Framework, um, which we contribute to, um, as does you know, as do all of government. But I think that's where the measure can 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 be affected. That's where you are identify in terms of economic impact or, or or other. The other the area that has probably the biggest challenge in relation to international framework is judging um, intergovernmental. Uh, success or judging um, cultural soft power diplomacy is far more difficult. And, and I, I noted some of the evidence you've already received from from other uh, sub states uh, in, in in relation in relation to that. So um, that's that's more of a challenge. But in terms of whether the economic impact, quite clearly, you have the opportunity to have an impact. And I think, um, interestingly, the uh, the export figures are particularly important, where uh, there's been 40% increase in the last six years. Uh, the big challenge we have is increasing the number of uh, companies, for example, that are supported in relation to export activity. Um, again, that has uh, significantly grown um, in recent years. But again, that will be we'll be looking at that. It's not just about inward job. It's not just about the the investment and jobs that are created from um, else, other countries and uh, other companies in other countries investing in Scotland, and um, that's still important. And again, Scotland still is performing extremely well, and um, in relation to um, outside London, still you know being the best in the UK at attracting inward investment and jobs. What I think you've seen with the change with is the focus on um, internationalisation of, as I was explained to to Jimmy McGregor, smaller companies in Scotland who have not yet. Uh, engage in that export market, and I think that's going to be a big uh, test of our, um, our, our, uh, our proposals going forward. We're on the trajectory, we are improving quite significantly, but that will be, I think, for the country, one of the big um, ways of measuring the success of what we're doing. But that's only the economic aspect, and I said the international framework covers um, you know, whether it's uh, intergovernmental, political, or indeed cultural aspects as well. Can I ask? Cabinet Secretary, um, you mentioned there about some of the our smaller businesses um, within Scotland. What kind of support are we giving those smaller businesses um, to branch out and reach out to other countries? Well, a lot of it is, again, is the advice that can be provided here in uh, relation to entry markets. Again, probably best placed by I would, you know, looking at the, the inquiry that the other committee has just been conducting in this area, but obviously in relation to Companies coming through Business Gateway, for example, and they can be identified as potentially as, as potential to have export opportunities. They are then connected by the um, uh, are contacted by the, the SDI in order to identify. There can be briefings. There can be um, cross-sector um, international trade missions. There can be um, trade missions into countries for people interested in that particular um, area. We've had, for example, to give you a more recent example, I know the, the, the committee's taken interest in Poland. I spoke at an event with the, um, the ambassador uh, uh, for Poland where we brought together, it was a business conference for people interested in exporting to, to Poland. So again, that's about building the capacity here. A lot of it's the preparation, understanding of how things work. There's also the opportunity to put them in touch with global Scots who are operating um, in that sector or indeed that geography um, uh, you know, internationally to, to give advice. So that, that's how it works. But I would recommend that that's been the focus of the other committee's inquiry, so that might help you in, in giving an overview of what already happens. Uh, what we're trying to do, though, is to make it a bit more um, coordinated in country, and that's where two aspects, the one Scotland partnerships, and the innovation investment hubs is more where you might focus on digital or you might focus on food and drink, for example, or, or a particular um, area of expertise. They will be different for different different sectors and in different different countries and that's what we're but it won't just be a government initiative obviously again in this area a lot of our either um, companies but particularly um, universities will have a, a key interest in this as well and just lastly um, just really to go back to something that you'd said in your opening statement about the one Scotland hubs is there a timeline on for those to uh, I'd, like, I'd, I'd like to say yes, but I, mean, I think we have to do it on a practical basis, and I think it will be country by country and, and sector by sector. So the One Scotland Partnerships, um, will, you know, we're looking to develop this, we want to make progress, obviously, in the very near future. But I think it would be a hostage fortune to say, I can tell you, guarantee you, by this time we will have X, Y and Z. And um, I, th I think it's really important that the One Scotland Partnerships bring together um, the different public agencies 
um, but they're doing it in a way that's appropri appropriate for each country, and each country will be different. So in some countries, your governmental influence um, institutionally is very important, because in some countries, that's the kind of the status will uh, provide you with opportunities that otherwise you might not have. In other countries, it's less so, and actually the, the trade, the SDI involvement will be at a greater amplification, but it will vary from country to country. So I don't want to give you a, a time scale that I can't. I, I, you know, I, I can't guarantee, but what I will do is make sure between myself and John Swinney, we keep not just your um, committee, but also the Economy and Enterprise Committee informed of progress. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Rod Campbell. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, that was a lot of the points I was going to raise, but can I just uh, refer you to a comment of the British Council about uh, on the. Um, the international framework suggesting that the Scottish Government's ability to achieve significant impact across the portfolio of actions encompassed by the international framework is restricted because of the size of that budget and there's a danger of uh, spreading limited resources too thinly. Uh, have you a general comment on that? Okay. Well, the British Council were part of the the development of the international framework. They were obviously we recognised them as a, a partner that we work with extensively. Um, I think that's probably a request from the British Council for more support for the things that they actually do. But I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't blame them for that. Um, there is a point about focusing on which countries you work on, and that always that's an issue we always have. Come at this, this, you, I get a demand from parliamentarians, well, why aren't you working in this country, in that country, and whatever, and then you'll get the response, well, actually, you might be spreading the jam too thinly if you're not um, operating. I think culturally we, we're doing very well. Um, we have an international outlook from our, uh, our national companies. I've, I've you know, uh, continued to support that. I think the James plays that were extremely successful last year, we're hopeful we'll have a... Uh, an extended uh, run. You've seen the kind of black watch uh, role from National Theatre previously. Um, so there is something in sort of culturally that activity, but we do focus, and there's quite a good kind of alignment in focusing. So for the British Council, let's take example, Celtic Connections, very important for tourism in, Scot in Scotland in the month of January in Glasgow, very international, tran transatlantic, but also uh, pick different partners at different times. So um, the India Connection, for example, I was in Rajasthan when we signed the agreement between the Rajasthan Folk Festival and and Celtic connections, and there's been a focus on India. They have focused years, and also in that area, Australia and New Zealand as well are quite focused. But um, I think it's also very important, and the British Council acknowledge this. You, in artistic and cultural areas, you've got to go with the partnerships, and the uh, connections are already there. The idea you can enforce a, a top-down approach of, of of where you will be and what you will do. A lot of it has to evolve from the sector itself. We've got a very strong um, sector <laughs> in Scotland. We've got a vibrant sector. We support South by Southwest for example, in terms of music in the US um, on a very strong basis and we're always looking for other opportunities um, I think it's wise counsel just to be careful that you're not doing too much in too many areas but if you're doing so uh, I think the point there is acknowledge your budget so uh, the one thing you know, in going forward is, is recognising that culture is very much a calling card um, for Scotland and its brand has been talked about. So you know, when you're looking, it's non-statutory. It doesn't, in, in many regards, in terms of um, you know, other service provisions um, in other areas that the, you know, this parliament has as overview from. But it is, it's very important to have a vibrant and healthy cultural sector. And I think that's the warning that uh, British Council are giving, that within restricted budgets, there's limits to what you can do. I wouldn't like to see in a situation that all, all of our cultural activity is just domestic. Um, I think it's important for all those issues about cultural relations, soft power, diplomacy, that we have that exchange and that understanding. You can't do business with a country you don't understand. And how do you understand other countries? It's through their culture and heritage. Thank you. Uh, a slightly different question in, in terms of the trade and investment strategy. The document refers to the development of that strategy, setting out the approach to trade and investment. Um, can you just develop that a wee bit more? Well, yeah. right, right at the beginning, I tried to give you the context of how, as a government, we've, all, these, all these different aspects are interlinked. So you had the, the programme for government, you had the economic strategy, which indicated that we'd be developing that international trade policy. We've got the international framework, we've got the European Action Plan. The next one will be the international um, trade policy. So it's, they're part of the suite of the strategies and plans that we're taking forward. So that it flows from that. But bearing in mind, we've just produced the, the ec um, economic strategy. It's going to come from that. A lot of it, though, will be informed by how we do things in relation to the innovation and investment hubs, for example. And that's, as I explained to Antagon, is in development. 
Well, we're, we're still not sure on the timetable, or you're not going to commit yourself to a timetable. No, I'm not, because I'm, I'm yeah. I know you're right to me saying, have you done it? <laughs> 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 okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Jimmy, we're up against the time scale. Is it a quick question? A You've quick got question. Your final question. Just on the yeah. cultural front, um, and Scotland's international profile, we already have a reputation of having probably the best international festival in the world, in the, in, in the, the Edinburgh International Festival. Uh, couldn't, could more be done to develop the, um, the visual art scene, which is so strong, it, particularly in Glasgow, uh, by, having a festival, by having an arts festival on the, you know, the lines of the Venice Biennale, for example, um, that, 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 that we should something that would, I'm sure would be an enormously successful in Scotland. Glasgow does have a, a, an international arts festival that's, that's very, very strong. Um, so uh, I'll make sure and let them know and ask them to invite you to make sure you see it. I think your point about can we make more of it, I think, is absolutely right. Well, that's and, what and that's, I, think, yeah, I, I think. I think that's a fair point. Because um, obviously having the Turner Prize uh, in Glasgow this year, again, is a strong recognition of the contemporary art scene that we have uh, in, in Glasgow in particular, but in Scotland. And remember the impact, one of the biggest impacts we had, it was on the Generation um, exhibition that was in uh, 60 to 70 countries, uh, sorry, 60 to 70 locations within Scotland um, as part of the Commonwealth Game Cultural Programme. That was a retrospective of 25 years of contemporary art of a, of a country. I'm not sure that any other country, well, there may be some undoubtedly, but there will be very few countries in the world would be able to produce such a quality exhibition uh, because of the work that's come out of Scotland in the last 25 years. So it's not just about um, heritage and our traditions. We, are, we have a reputation in terms of contemporary visual art, and I'd like to, take, to see what we can do to take up your, your, your interest, particularly in promoting not just, obviously, what we know happens in Edinburgh in terms of international festivals, but the profile of Glasgow and the rest of our, our art scene. Thank you. We do have Glasgow City Council's international officer on the next... Uh, panel, so maybe that, that's a, a, a question for the Very, very quick final question, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you and I were out in, in the States for Scotland Week and Outlander is huge. I didn't expect it to be. I'm, I'm on book five. I'm a total fan. Um, but just I know that uh, it, on the back of Jamie's question about the visual arts, our film uh, and screen um, industry seems to be you know, gathering some pace as well. And just very quickly, if you can tell us the, some of the uh, advances that have been made there. I, again, can I say there's another committee that's looking at that issue as, as well. Uh, there's, there's great opportunities. There are challenges, undoubtedly. And, uh, um, but in terms of development there, it's not just about trying to secure a studio, a permanent studio. We have got a temporary studio that obviously is filming Outlander. Outlander, in terms of the spend, is the biggest inward investment in terms of screen that Scotland's seen. As, as you said, actually, the impact in terms of audiences in the US is huge. You've seen Dune Castle, which is Castle Lake in the in the production, um, seeing its, its, its numbers increase substantially, <coughs> and you're getting tours in Fife and indeed in my hometown of Linlithgow because of Blackness Castle and, and Linlithgow Palace. So the, the knock-on impact of location is very important, but I answered a question in um, the Chamber just last week. It's not just about location. I also met with um, international um, film uh, producers and studio representatives um, just the other week in Glasgow and the skill base we have is very strong and what I want to do is to make sure that great skill base we have can do work in Scotland not always in, uh, have to, to leave to, to do that and I think that's one of the ambitions we have but the more we show Scotland on screen and it's one of the discussions I had with Lionsgate who produced um, the Hunger Games and um, and Surgeon and, and that range, but the more you know, we, we can use locations of Scotland, the, it does have a knock-on effect. And you saw Skyfall, for example, the Glencoe um, scene um, at the end of that had had a big impact in people wanting to go and see what this vast, kind of uh, atmospheric, uh, amazing scenery was in in real life. And I'll just finally, as we're finishing, our coordinate. we haven't much talked about a coordination with Visit Scotland and the tourist side of it. Scotland is authentic in so many ways in the quality of its education, integrity um, of its governance, its welcome of its people, um, and in its built and natural heritage. They are wonderful assets, but they are also authentic experiences for people coming to see here. In a world, a world of globalisation and of film, where people see things, people want to experience it as well. And I think that gives us great opportunities for the future. 
Excellent. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure we could have uh, talked all morning, but we, we do have another panel. Can I thank you uh, for coming along to committee and look forward to working with you again in the future. I'm going to suspend briefly, um, uh, just to allow a change over of witnesses and maybe a wee check on the... Uh, good morning and welcome back to uh, the European and External Relations Committee. Um, we're moving on to agenda item two, which is the continuation of our inquiry on Connecting Scotland. And uh, I'm delighted to have with us uh, a round table of guests this morning. We have Elaine Ballantyne, who's the Head of External Relations and Investor Support Economic Development from the City of Edinburgh Council. We have Anil Gupta, who's the Chief Officer Communities from the Convention of Local Authorities, COSLA. There you are. <laughs> Malcolm Leach is a European officer from the West Scotland European Forum. Uh, Joanne Scobie is the EU officer, policy and partnerships, East of Scotland European 
Forum, and Gillian Walsh, who's the International Officer for Glasgow City Council, and you're sitting right next to Jamie, he's got lots of questions for you. <laughs> Gillian, welcome all the, the, this morning, and thank you very much for your written evidence. We've had um, a huge amount of written evidence in this inquiry, and it's been very helpful indeed, and we have a, a number of questions uh, to go on. You'll understand the format of um, a sort of a round table. If you catch my eye, we'll try and keep the conversation as free-flowing as, as possible. Um, but just you know, try and coordinate through me. And um, I, I can see everybody's whites of their eyes, so um, it's much, much easier for me to, to, to coordinate that. Um, and I'll, I'll probably just uh, start with a, a, an opening question about you know, the importance of international engagement to you and your organisation, and obviously by extension uh, uh, to Scotland. And I'll just open that to the floor, and who's, who's first in? Keen, there you go. So, yes, um, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, I think for the City of Edinburgh Council, we've always um, taken a very international outlook. And um, to be honest, even if we uh, were not taking an international outlook, we received so many requests um, from delegations and from projects and interests internationally um, that we indeed have a very busy agenda on, on an inward basis as well. Um, the areas of work um, that we're involved in include international relations, projects and activities, which um, I've outlined in my evidence, but also we're very active on um, the EU side through networks such as Eurocities and through the um, applications that we make for uh, partnerships and for European funding. Um, I would say that all the departments across the Council have an element of international work. It varies according to resource and to subject area, um, but that perhaps is manifested quite importantly in the number of international visits and delegations that they all receive, um, where the gain is most definitely on the exchange of international good practice. So services are open to uh, international good practice and are also um, very good at coming for with examples where they can share as well um, their own um, experience of service delivery. Yeah. Uh, local governments, you're probably aware we have um, a fairly significant role in the implementation of European legislation, um, particularly in areas of transport, environment, um, but also economic development and various elements of infrastructure. Uh, a result of that is that um, local authorities generally are quite concerned about uh, the extent of discretion locally in how you implement uh, legislation and the need for flexibility to achieve the outcomes that the European Parliament um, wishes to see being delivered across um, countries affected by the treaty. Uh, what we are uh, primarily involved in is to support uh, elected representatives from local government in a variety of fora that uh, exist in the European Union and the European stage. And uh, of those, we've got, uh, in particular, the Committee of the Regions representatives, which uh, we have four of, uh, alongside your own. Uh, we also have representatives on the Congress of um, the local and regional authorities in the Council of Europe. Um, we lobby reasonably actively on the legislative programmes of the European Union, um, there's obviously very extended time frames that you're aware of, which allow us to consult with our members through COSLA's own government structure. Uh, and as part and parcel of that, we work quite closely with uh, senior officers from local authorities who have more on the ground experience. Um, on a broader level, we do a fair amount of work um, around, well, we have responsibilities for some work on uh, matters like the Covenant of Mayors, which is uh, a network arrangement around responding to climate change matters. Uh, we are formally involved as part of the twinning arrangements within the Committee of European Municipalities and Regions, which aims to try and improve um, and, and extend uh, arrangements around international aid as well as less, uh, more sisterly arrangements. Um, and there's going to be uh, considerable work that we'd be anticipating around the uh, sustainable development goals into the future. Uh, I think I'll stop there. I'm sure we'll pick up some of these issues uh, later on. Yeah, Malcolm Leach. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, convener, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation, firstly, to submit written evidence, and secondly, to come along and have a conversation with you and your colleagues uh, this morning. Uh, just very briefly, uh, you know, the West Scotland European Forum is a sort of lean, mean organisation. <laughs> it's not the vast uh, resources. So what we're there very much to do is to try and encourage our member uh, authorities uh, to take uh, a full interest in the range of uh, European, because we only do European rather than wider international, uh, European issues that affect how they deliver services to their uh, communities. So uh, that's not just looking at the funding, though that's really important, uh, especially if we've just gone through a process of, uh, sort of redefining how, in particular, European uh, regional cohesion policy is deployed in the 2014-2020 period. That obviously uh, was a major uh, uh, item of work that we undertook collectively uh, via the forum, but we're also looking to try and stimulate involvement in some of the other EU funding programmes, uh, many of which, of course, as the committee will be aware, require sort of transnational uh, partners. Uh, so we're thinking of some of the aspects of Horizon 2020, of the sort of European territorial cooperation programmes that are part funded through the European Regional Development Fund. So we're doing a, a range of things to try and stimulate and promote uh, you know, better and, uh, and uh, more informed participation in these programmes. But we understand that it's not just solely about funding. Uh, there is policies and legislation that are originating from uh, the EU, uh, which, as Anil has already hinted, have quite direct impacts on how we uh, arrange and deliver uh, a number of our public services. Our role is to find the niche where there's a particular regional dimension that impacts on the the west of Scotland, and one of the sort of portfolios that we've spent a lot of time on in the last couple of years has been on the sort of regional aid guidelines that the European Commission uh, uh, put in place uh, for every sort of uh, policy and funding period, and that was really the background to the subsidiary review uh, that took place over, uh, over the last couple of years, and impacts on the extent to which we can, uh, public authorities can support investment that will create jobs in our communities. So that's a really important issue that we handled, which wasn't directly to do with EU funding and stuff, but has a, had a big impact on uh, you know, what we can do to support uh, sustainable growth and development in our part of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne. Um, thank you, convener, and thank you again for the invitation to submit the written evidence. And thank you to the committee for um, this initiative of Connecting Scotland, it's been very useful for us to see what our colleagues across the country are doing in terms of twinning initiatives um, and funding, etc. Um, at ESEC, um, we work on a policy and funding basis, so we try to identify a common European shared agenda um, in terms of policy, which will have an impact on our local authorities. And we seek to work together in partnerships on these transnational funding programmes as well. There's a growing importance, a growing realisation of how important these are. Um, so for the, the new programmes, for example, there's very much uh, a focus on the, the interreg programmes um, that we are eligible for. Um, in terms of policy, the, the energy union that we just proposed in February is something that's going to have an impact on our members. So we're seeking how, how we can somehow shape and influence this and make sure that the voice of local authorities are heard. And this, of course, on the East Coast, in terms of renewables and oil and gas energy, is um, hugely important. And we're also seeking to improve our um, Team Scotland approach. So it's not just within um, individual local authorities or the East Coast, we're seeking to engage with our colleagues across the country to identify that shared agenda. And um, that's it for now, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gillian. Um, Glasgow City Council is very committed to its international agenda, um, as well as a fairly high number of inward delegations um, into the city, as Elaine said, very similar to our colleagues in Edinburgh, where the biggest outcome really is the exchange of technical expertise and knowledge. We also have an extensive Twin City programme. We have over eight Twin Cities. Probably around any given time, just over half of them are very active. We try very hard to involve as many different sectors of our, com our community in the city to get involved in the Twin Cities. So it's not 
the kind of traditional civic ceremonial side of things. We try very hard, for example, in the last year we've had um, learning disabled groups, we've had sporting delegations, we've had cultural, artistic exchanges. So we try to involve as many different sectors of this, the community in Glasgow in our Twin City exchanges. We also have an extensive um, Commonwealth and International Development Programme, which is about just over 10 years old now, where our primary focus has been on Malawi. We also have projects in uh, South Africa. Um, so we're trying very hard now to look at projects where we can attract more EU funding. Um, due to restructuring within the council, we've lost quite a lot of our staff over the years. So our team is very small. Um, and as you know, any application for EU funding is very time consuming. But it is something that we're looking at um, more closely now because we have a very limited budget and we try very hard to attract sponsorship or funding from other sources to obviously improve the projects that we do, but attracting EU funding is a big focus for us now. I seen, uh, Gillian, I seen a, 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 I heard a radio report the other day about Glasgow being commended for its international uh, business attraction and, and the impact that that's had, right down to taxi drivers knowing the venues, to signpost and to things like that. Is that something that, that you would be very... Uh, um, a, a key element uh, in that, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, we work closely with the Glasgow City Marketing Bureau, um, which, as you know, has a huge success over the years in attracting conferences to the city. But part of that success is that they work very closely in partnership with a whole range of organisations in the city. And the taxi drivers are a good example. Um, when we had the Commonwealth Games last summer, um, they were part of a huge team that welcomed the visitors to the city, from the volunteers right through to you know, people serving in shops. So I think that that partnership approach has been very successful. Um, we recently, I think within the last two years, we now have a business investment manager who's looking solely at inward investment into the city, um, and they have a small team again. So I think a lot of the success that Glasgow's had in terms, for example, of conference, conferences into the city is down to the partnership approach. OK, thank you. I'm going to go to open questions. I think, Jamie, do you want to kick off? Yes. Um, I'm quite interested in it, especially with the, the, the Glasgow... Uh, I was talking earlier about Scotland's reputation for having, you know, the best international festival in the world in Edinburgh, um, which I think is a, a fairly... You know, taken for granted that we, have, we do have it now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and more pointing to the, you know, the visual arts scene in Glasgow being so strong and whether more could be done to promote, to promote that. I, I, I was inform you know I know there is an art festival in Glasgow but um, perhaps more on the sort of lines of, 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 of a sort of Venice Biennale idea and I know I'll put this I remember asking the same question to Frank McAviti a long time ago and um, <coughs> uh, it just it seemed to go on but it's never come to anything and uh, I thought the success of the, the International Festival in Edinburgh you know, it could be sort of replicated mm -hmm. the whole way across the central belt if you like linked across the central belt and, um, but the, the, the other thing is, I would like to ask, do you get, um, so what, what is the support from the Scottish Government like uh, and its agencies in, in, in developing the international cultural links? I can't answer for the visual arts sector. It's not my sector, but I can say that the culture programme that ran alongside the Commonwealth Games last summer was very successful, and I think it was a good opportunity for us as a city to look at what we're doing and look at how we might expand on that. Um, I think in terms of funding, um, I can't answer that question, unfortunately. It's not my area, but I can certainly take that back to Glasgow and ask. Yes, and, and going on from that then further... Um, you know, with the, the things like the twinning and the, 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 the very good things which are bringing people together. Uh, do you have examples of trade links or, um, you know, examples of where business has, uh, has, has really benefited um, from, these, from these links? I'm not asking you specifically. Mm -hmm. It's just the question is to anybody in the... Really. Anil, did you want to come in here? Actually, partly in response to your earlier point about the support from... Uh, the Scottish Government and its agencies. Um, Scottish local government and the Scottish Government do have a joint working arrangement uh, uh, at a, a member level, uh, and we meet roughly every quarter to three times a year to look at issues of um, sports, arts and culture. So uh, 
the Cabinet Secretary turns up to that, and we do talk about our relationships with bodies like Creative Scotland. At this stage, we haven't taken it further in the direction that you're suggesting in, uh, namely looking at internationalisation. But uh, given the Commonwealth Games experience last year, um, the issue of major spectacular events is sort of just below the surface and is something I'm sure that we'll be wanting to have a look at about how we best exploit and develop that into the future. Aline, did you want to come in here? Yes, thank you, convener. Um, just on the uh, question regarding Scottish Government support for initiatives, um, City of Edinburgh Council um, will tomorrow launch its um, incubation base for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Shenzhen in China. And that project has been very much endorsed and supported by the, um, um, the um, First Secretary based in Beijing as part of the Scottish Government. Um, and I think it's a very good example of working over a long period from a very early stage of developing relations, both at um, the governmental level and at the local authority level, and how bringing those together can be a very powerful um, force in terms of influence and also getting things to be delivered on the ground. So we very much see our MOU with Shenzhen as part of the Scotland-China plan, and as I say, it has been very well supported, and, and we launched that tomorrow um, with a number of companies taking up space. We will also offer... Um, uh, Shenzhen companies the same opportunity back in Edinburgh. Um, so it's the first time we've done it, uh, but I have to say it has been very well supported. Excellent. I think Hansala wants to come in on a supplementary, then I'll let you back in, Jamie. Yeah? Yeah. Hansala. Let, you let him come in and, and I'll think of something else. <laughs> so kind of you, Jamie. <laughs> Jamie, it was, it was just the back of your uh, question about Scottish government support to uh, cities and Anil Gupta's um, a very good uh, intervention in, in terms of what normally happens, but unfortunately, Glasgow's membership of COSLA is in and out, and uh, we are more still time not there than in there, and therefore um, we probably don't get the full benefit of Anil and his office that we could get. But um, what I can do is give you an example of why Glasgow does suffer uh, from not getting support from the uh, Scottish government is. The example of the Glasgow Mela, for example, it's, it's its 25th anniversary this year, and it's only going to be a one-day Mela. I know they're going to have a few satellites dotted around the city, which is rubbish, but it's not the Mela, and please nobody try to convince me otherwise, but to have a, a one-day Mela on the 25th anniversary of the biggest, most successful event in Glasgow uh, just shows the, the, the lack of sensitivity in this area. And I'm not blaming you because I know it's not directly under your uh, area of influence, but as an international department within the city, I think you would have benefited by supporting uh, Glasgow Life and Glasgow Sport. Um, if you were in that, um, if you had that facility available to you. And I think the, the fact that we're not part of COSLA just now means that we don't get the benefit from COSLA as well. I know the Mela event is always very, very popular in the city, yeah. and I know there's a lot of disappointed people that it's not going to be bigger. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay, Jamie, do you want to finish your line of question? Well, yes, um, just on the question of access to European funding. Um, the, 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 this, we've, we've looked into this before on the Horizon 2020 stuff, and, and um, to, how easy do you find it? or uh, to, to access European funding. Uh, I mean, are there difficulties? Is, is enough being done by Scottish Government to make it easy for uh, local authorities to actually know what they can access? Joanne. Um, accessing European funding is difficult. There are uh, around 40 different programmes, all with different eligibility requirements. Um, different budget structures, etc. But recently, Scotland Europa, along with WOSEF, ESEC, and the Scottish Government, have developed an EU funding portal. Um, and this is going to be a one-stop shop which has information on all these different funding programmes, and also it has a database of all the previous projects which have been funded by Europe, and they're 
are approximately 4,000 previous projects. It gives details on different sectors, on the different partners. So I think that um, accessing European funding is difficult. There's so much of it. There's so much different requirements. But we are hoping that this <coughs> funding portal, which has been done along with um, the collaboration with the Scottish Government, will help to address that. Malcolm, you want to add to that? Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, ourselves in the west of Scotland, we also support the, the development of the funding portal. We think it's a really positive thing, and I know it's, I think it's highlighted in your Brussels bulletin that you'll be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, I just would like to emphasise that having a portal is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to improving Scottish participation in the programmes, and it needs so much more uh, to be fully successful. That needs to be complemented by uh, more uh, activities than just you know, the website which, and the portal, which is good. Uh, so we're very keen, and indeed we have a meeting of our, our, of our forum next week where we're going to ask the Scottish Government if the, if the elected members agree just to s sort of clarify how moving forward, now that most of the programmes, the funding programmes for 2014 to 2020 are now in place, how it's going to work proactively with stakeholders uh, to improve uh, the uptakes. Not the uptake was poor in the previous uh, period, but we, I think, uh, like the old school report card, you know, could do better uh, on that. So we're very keen to sort of uh, work with Scottish Government. The portal itself will need to be uh, refreshed on an ongoing basis as, uh, as new projects come on stream with Scottish partners. We need to make sure that database is up to date so people know, uh, you know what's, what's been approved so they're not uh, duplicating uh, an area that's already been covered and therefore wasting time in an abortive application. But I think just to take up another point that was hinted at in some of the earlier evidence, a lot of these EU uh, transnational programmes are really good, but success rates do vary. In some of the interreg programmes that I was familiar with in the 27 uh, 13 period, no success rate was as low as 10 to 15 per cent. So, you know, this is, a, uh, this is the reality of a lot of these competitive uh, EU programmes uh, that, are, that are out there. Preparing a transnational project takes time, it takes effort, and it actually does involve, you know, sometimes actually having to meet the people in the environment. It can't all be done by emails and Skypes and other, however important these have been to ease communications compared to when I first started working in this field, when, when, when the fax was the, <laughs> was the state-of-the-art technology. So, uh, you know, things have got a whole lot better in communication, but sometimes you do need to meet potential partners face-to-face -face across the room to see if there is that sort of continuity of interest and you can work uh, with these people. So a lot of these things it, but it won't just happen on its own by having a portal. It does require, and it does, in order to get the benefits, require a significant investment of, down, of time to get to a worthwhile project, given that the competition for funds in many of these programmes is very, very intense. You all, you all know that this committee has taken a very, very keen interest in uh, EU funding, how, how it's um, you know, disseminated, how it's monitored, and uh, we do have the Cabinet Secretary, I think, in a wee while to, mm -hmm. to come in and talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember um, doing EU funding applications and monitoring forms when they were all on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I feel your pain. I've got Elaine and then Anil. Elaine. Convener, I just wanted to echo the points that have been made already um, in terms of the competitiveness of European funding and the extent of the brokerage that needs to be done now in, in, in partnership working. Um, you, you obviously need the experts from the service delivery areas plus the EU funding experts to combine forces. The key thing here is innovation, um, the capacity within a local authority to bring forward innovation to um, make sure that the bids that we spend one year or more working on are as competitive as they can. Be. I think that's the biggest challenge. But also there's um, changes within the way the brokerage works um, you know, across Europe with um, what they call lighthouse cities and follower cities, depending on where you are in terms of the capacity that you have to lead a project or to be a follower. Um, so the, the scenario is changing quickly. And the outcome of that for a local authority is their capacity to build innovation and their capacity to take part in that brokerage. And to be honest, it has to be um, in country. Um, as Malcolm says, Skype and email is fine, but actually it's so fast um, and the brokerage events are so huge, you actually need probably more than one person there at a time. So that is a challenge for us because, because we are tight, small teams. Um, and as I say, you often need the person there as well who is from that delivery area as well as the person who can do the European funding and the brokerage. Yeah, Anil. 
Just very quickly, I mean, we, uh, COS has always been concerned about the competitive nature of some of the funding and uh, obviously very aware of the point that Malcolm was making about the very low success rates and therefore the considerable amount of resources that are going in um, with no result. So we are very pleased uh, between March 2011 and uh, September 2013 to be involved in discussions with the Scottish Government uh, with the EU Structural Funds High Level Group which try to simplify some of the processes and ensure a greater proportion of the total allocation of structural funds came to local government, approximately, a, I think, a third now. Uh, clearly, that is now in place up until 2020, um, but we're now looking at the post-2020 arrangements and actively involved on a European level with our sister local authority associations in discussions with the Commission about what shape the new things should be like. Um, one of my members of staff, who you may have already met, I think, Serafin uh, Patsos Vidal, um, is uh, a convener of a working group uh, on a European level, which he may well have told you, um, which allows him fairly direct, direct access to working group arrangements to try and continue that simplification process. Clearly, um, as we move on down the community planning partnership route, we'd like to see even more being delegated at a local level so that we're a bit clearer and the process is more transparent than they have been in the past. Excellent. Yes, yeah, Seraphin keeps this committee very well briefed of all of the work that, he, that he's doing, um, and I do have contact with him when, when Clary's on and we're out in Strasbourg, so it um, keeps me well up to date. Holly Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. I just wonder if I could open up a, a wee discussion on, uh, well, part of the discussion we had with the Cabinet Secretary earlier. I mean, she's talking to the committee about the Scottish Government's action plan for... EU engagement and so on and so forth and there's clear objectives in that uh, nationally I'm interested in how that sort of thing pans out locally and for example my colleague sitting beside me here Mr Leach from the west of Scotland I'm Kilmarnock and Urban Valley and MSP I'm interested in how that works locally on the ground and where we can see for example the benefits of that national strategy panning out in somewhere like Ayrshire so my question really is, when, when, the, when a government, any government, rethinks or devises a new strategy for e, EU engagement, how does it pan out locally for yourselves and how do you begin to implement that locally to try and make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet? Anil, yeah. Can you just uh, point out that one of the things that we are involved in fairly active discussions at a civil servant local government, COSLA level, is how we provide input into the strategies and action plans at their conception rather than just downstream once they have been drafted. And we believe that it's quite important that we have a more active role. Fortunately, this time, I think we've, we're much more content than we have been previously. But um, it might be something useful to consider the extent to which uh, other European um, practice, which involves local authority associations on a formal basis, could be reflected better in arrangements in Scotland. Um, some examples, I think, have already been provided to you, but a lot of them are essentially Scandinavian, Netherlands, and so on. Uh, but there are fairly good ties between the committee structures of the parliaments and um, the local authority associations, uh, which allow early dialogue to take place. I thought I'd just mention that before we talk about the practical side with our member authorities and non-member authorities. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way dialogue then, I think that's what, you, what you're saying. I mean, if, if you were a member of the public in somewhere like Command or Northern Valley, right, and you picked up the strategy and went, oh, that's lovely. What did it mean for us? How, how do local people see the outcomes from this stuff, you know, drifting down to, to local community? How do we see the benefits of these great initiatives that are, that are supported, I think, by everyone around the table? How do we see that? How does the public see it? European strategies or, or international frameworks and those will incorporate the Scottish Government's broader economic strategies and, um, and European objectives as well as the, the European Union's also such as the Europe 2020 strategy which is about smart sustainable and inclusive growth and this is very much aligned with what the Scottish Government is aiming to achieve 
and um, local authorities as well. Uh, a lot of the local authorities will host workshops, um, business briefings, for example, on subjects like European funding and how SMEs, local SMEs, or, or even individuals can access those types of funds. It's about a bit of um, uh, raising awareness of the, these strategies on the ground through such briefings. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, you know, as I said, and uh, as was stated in the written evidence that the, the forum put forward, I've, this is a really extremely timely uh, inquiry that the committee is doing, because in the West Scotland European Forum, we're currently sort of trying to refresh our strategy and what we're very keen and what our chair is very keen on is that the benefits drill down from, you know, from even the local authority level to much more to the sort of community-based uh, uh, level that I think a colleague was hinting at in his, in his, in his question. Uh, give one example, a very good example of where European uh, engagement can have a very significant uh, community impact is on the Urbac programme. Now, the Urbac programme isn't just for large cities. Uh, there's no sort of minimum population, uh, you know, it's, it's almost a sort of self-definition, so don't, I would suggest, just think it's only for Glasgow, Edinburgh, and D, Aberdeen, or uh, the other cities in, in Scotland. Uh, the whole ethos of Urbac is about getting local action groups going, working on the specific topic covered by it, and there's one or two examples that have been uh, put forward in, in some of the evidence. Uh, the ones I'm familiar with are like the Romanet project, and which is doing a lot of very good work in the Govan Hill part of Glasgow. Uh, and that's very much about involving local... Uh, you know, there's a requirement of getting access to the uh, Urbac funding that there's a local action group involving community representatives to try and work together in partnership as to how they can improve the services or address the topic that has been identified by the project. That's a generic requirement of all uh, urban projects, for example, that it has to have that local community uh, dimension. I mean, if the Scottish Government is talking about encouraging innovation and growth and opportunity and all, all those worthy things, how, how, do local folk, how do local folk actually see that it's, it's getting done, though? See, at the end of a year or next year or a year after, local folk come to ask folk like us, hey, what did you do about that and what were the benefits and what did we get out of it? How do we tell them? How do you articulate it? You know, Who reports to who about the success or otherwise of these, these wonderful initiatives? Where do we see this? Who do you report to? Who, who, you know? For example, um, recently the Scottish Government um, compiled its uh, national reform programme and its EU action plan, so it consulted with different stakeholders, including local authorities, for um, case studies, positive case studies. So there were quite a few submitted in terms of the structural funds um, and uh, interreg projects as well. I think it can be challenging communicating it down to the local level, especially when there is such scepticism about Europe at the moment as well. Um, and it can be challenging getting uh, the right people or even um, the community onto these uh, local action groups for or backed or for leader or for the different programmes. So that's it's certainly that's always a challenge for us. Um, if there has been a successful project, project um, making the community aware that this was filtered down through European funding, sometimes that message does get lost. Mm -hmm. I think that, that message is certainly in Malcolm's paper about some of the media approaches to Europe, and, and we've spoken at this committee about how we better articulate the benefits coming from the European Union that we share, and, and we're not very good at sharing that, and we, we need to be collectively better at doing that. So I was interested in what your views are about how to lift that up and make it more accessible to the public so they can see what's going on in their communities in, a, in an easily easy to read and understand fashion. You know? yeah. Jamie, did you have a supplementary on this? Well, it was just aspect? purely on the, the... I mean, I note that, that you know, um, in the written evidence that COSLA is responsible for um, leading the Scottish local authorities in their sort of policy-making in terms of, of, of the European Union, and that, but, um, which is fine. What, what I'm... As an MSP, you know, and this is coming back to the point you made about um, small and medium enterprises and individuals who actually want to seek... Uh, European funding. Um, I think there's a difficulty here because I think this is part of where Euroscepticism stems from in many ways. They see it as a sort of huge curtain 
and these vast sort of um, strands of different things which are very difficult to pull apart. And, and, you, you, know, and you, you put your finger on it, I think, when you said, you, you know, there's a difficulty in, in these people actually accessing European funding. How can you make... I mean, could Cosler, could Cosler do something to make, make it more obvious to, to individual businesses and, and uh, people who actually really want to, you know, for the benefit of industry and actually creating jobs uh, and livelihoods, uh, who want to use this money, make it more obvious the portals to which they should go to actually get it? Yes, true. I mean, one of the things that COSLA uh, has responsibility for is the central resource available to Business Gateway, which is supporting the SMEs. Um, I, it's been a while since I've been directly involved in that. And I think possibly Malcolm uh, being involved in Slade, the Scottish Local Authority Economic Development Group, can uh, respond a little bit to this. But um, it is used as a portal uh, uh, website where a lot of information is available, including on um, apps for phones and the like, which give, I think, quite a wealth of information about um, opportunities, funding opportunities, but that's backed up by direct contact with local economic development officers. So there's quite a few pointers about where to go. Um, similarly, I can remember some time ago when we are involved in the Better Regulation and the uh, Services Directive, uh, trying to break up the information into chunks that was useful and meaningful to SMEs about the opportunities that they were going to get in terms of the services directive to work out with uh, Scotland, as well as obviously to make sure that local authorities complied with their own requirements to ease the processes. Uh, but I, I'm, this isn't my area of expertise anymore. <laughs> Gillian, did you want to come in on that point? No, I was just going to come back to something I think someone said earlier about people not knowing what Europe does for them, I think, um, in our own area of work, certainly when we encourage our groups and organisations to apply for EU funding. Um, I think that there's no shortage of information out there for them. It's just, perhaps, as uh, Joanne said, it's the sheer bulk of information that's there and, and where do they go. But, and it's also capacity. This is Elaine said, it's down to capacity a lot of the time. But I know for our own citizens in Glasgow, for example, if we said to our average Glaswegian, how many twin cities does Glasgow have? They probably couldn't answer. Perhaps that's down to us as well. But I think when young people and people do get involved in European projects and they can see the benefits and they can see the benefits in their children, then they do definitely think, yeah, this is a good thing. But it's just, if you're not active in that area of work, then you probably don't know. What to give us about your insight? Yeah. Since the... Uh and he put the spotlight on me, because uh, one of the roles I do, I've been, I'm, I'm Slade's European funding spokesperson uh, on that, and we've certainly been working very hard over the last couple of years in terms of what we spend our, what I would call our domestic uh, European Regional Development Fund in terms of small business support, the points that uh, our colleague was making on that. Bearing in mind that uh, one of the key pillars of the refreshed economic strategy is internationalisation, uh, one of the key drivers of our uh, ERDF programme for supporting small businesses across Scotland, both Highlands and Lowlands, is uh, to try and improve the internationalisation of our SME base in Scotland. That's one of the key drivers in it. By and large, the, the, the general picture is one of trying to work with companies with growth potential. So what we're not using our limited European resources on the start-up, that's kind of done by the sort of core business gateway offer. What we're trying to do is work with companies with, with growth potential, and indeed one of the main ways you can grow is by internationalising your market. And that's, it is certainly that sort of part of the government's refreshed economic strategy is woven right through the interventions that are being done with ERDF support, both by the enterprise agencies and by local government through the business gateway network. I think it goes out to another thing, and this is why sometimes the European Commission is paranoid about needing the publicity for that. We need to be able to, they need, we need to make sure that when a company is getting support from a European funding programme that they are aware of it. Most of the support which won't become, that uh, SMEs can access won't come through direct application for European funds, but will come from uh, a, a public sector programme 
uh, that is, will be delivered by, in this case, either local authorities through Business Gateway or through the enterprise agencies. But it's our responsibility, and this is what we're audited on much more these days, that uh, when we're doing that, when we're giving a grant or giving some, some consultancy support or, or some business advice to these firms, that the, you know, the European dimension is upfront and obvious that this support is part financed from European funds. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you know that is... Uh, uh, you know, very much uh, to the fore, and that I think might hopefully answer some of the questions that uh, uh, Mr. McGregor was, was, was asking. <laughs> Lee. Just a um, couple of examples of how we've brought um, SMEs um, and the company base into our European funded projects because I think raising the awareness is probably best done by mm. engaging directly with people and showing how they can get involved. So our Interreg programme, which was the largest within the North West Europe programme, um, brought in um, the universities, the academia side and the um, small and medium sized enterprises in the city to look at innovation. It's called open innovation. The idea that there's, by sharing, there is opportunity arising. So that was very successful and we're ready to bid again with those partners. But also some of the new European funding programmes, although I've uh, indicated that they are very complex and highly competitive, they do actually allow us to bring in um, the private sector in a way that we were never allowed to do before. So companies that are able to provide um, you know, advanced technology, again innovation, um, can sit at the table and be part of the project. So that would be uh, two examples from our side about bringing the business sector in and being able to then, with the outcomes of the project, publish the size and um, the opportunity and where we got to in terms of from, from A to B with a particular project. Okay. Well, if you've completed your line of questioning yet. Thank you. Hanzala. Yeah, um, I think um, Willie had asked a very important question and I, 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 I actually agree with him that there needs to be some sort of central uh, pulling together of all the various strands to actually make a, a national report. Um, I think the fact that we have so many twin cities around the world from different cities, uh, we need to share that information more freely. We need to be able to share the successes and the failures so that we don't make the same mistakes. No point in reinventing the wheel. And also, I think in terms of uh, applying for funding, that also that information needs to be shared once you have been successful or you fail so that people know what not to do and what to do. I think those things are, those elements are very good, and I and I think that uh, perhaps the Scottish government could come up with some sort of solution in which they can create an agency of some sort, or even ask one of the agencies to take on that responsibility to actually put all that together. I think nationally we should have that, um, and perhaps even because things move so fast, um, that information needs to be available on online for people so that um, people can actually go in and uh, share that information with each other. When I talk about online, I'm talking about the, the, the authorities themselves initially, and I think it's just the sort of uh, the, the annual report thing can go online where, where ordinary individuals can tap in. And Gillian, you were quite right. I mean, if you ask a norm, uh, any citizen, normally they won't know how many cities are twinned with and what activities they do. In fact, I was looking at your report. It's very extensive, but one of the things missing was Last year, for example, there was 13 strong uh, delegation went to Lahore from Glasgow. We raised over 50,000 pounds for charity for the two twin hospitals to work with each other. And that was because of the twinning and because the, the hospitals are twinned, the cities are twinned. So that's, a lot of initiatives happen and not all of them go through the, the council sometimes, which is a shame because I think they should, because the council did support it. Um, so, I mean, these are, the sort of, these are good opportunities and good things and good news stories that we need to share with people. But I think a national body, and it comes from the question that you raised, in fact, who you're answerable to. I'm not sure that um, they're answerable to their own authorities because that's, a, that's where the responsibility is. But I think uh, sharing that is, is important, and I think we should be looking at how do we achieve that so that we can all benefit from each other. Anil. Just a very quick response about uh, sharing of information. Uh, COSLA and the Improvement Service have a number of uh, communities of practice, as we call them, which are intended to improve um, how people work, partly from examples of good and, unfortunately, occasionally poorer practice. Uh, so the knowledge, the knowledge Hub, which is the website, um, is available for examples to be 
uploaded onto and accessible by officers who are dealing with those policy areas. I understand that that is, also, that is the case for um, broad uh, European uh, areas of policy and obviously also the role of organisations such as Slade are quite key in providing a cross-council perspective on what is going on. Uh, so I, I think a fair bit of the coordination does happen at a local authority level. Um, I think what you what may be being missed out on a little is how you then make sense of the individual local authorities and the collective authorities' work as it integrates with the broader uh, Scottish work that is perhaps carried out by other agencies. And the narrative there is possibly missing. John. What struck me when I was going through this evidence, and I mentioned it before in my opening statement, was the, the, the connections that Scottish towns have internationally, and a lot of these, most of them I wasn't aware of before. We have very strong links, of course, within different cities, towns, regions within the European Union. Some of these twinning partnerships are 70 years old or, or even older. But, you know, I think if you were to look at this on a kind of map, and on a, like, like, as in a visual, you would see that we have connections with almost every country in the world. You know, there was Russia, there was Pakistan, South Africa, Chile, Australia, Canada, and the US. I wonder if something could be done that could produce some kind of visual for this and we could see how we are, where we are linked to across the country. That's, that would be real. I'm a visual person, so that would be very, very interesting to, to see that. And we are developing a new way of reporting on our committee, so maybe that's something we can look at. Rod. Thank you, convener. Would anyone on the panel like to comment on um, the importance of kind of school uh, trips, school activities um, externally, and what benefits accrue or problems with it? Gillian. School partnerships for us. Um, are a huge part of the Twin City programme. Um, we have a dedicated international education officer who deals with international education. Um, for us particularly, we're very keen to see our young people get involved in Twin City exchanges, perhaps young people who wouldn't traditionally get involved. So it's not the high flyers, it's not, not, not that they don't get involved, because they do, but we try really hard to attract young people who would who perhaps have never been abroad or would never in a million years think that it's something for them. And it is a lot more work to get them ready for that, that visit. But the benefits are huge. Um, and the, all the obvious <coughs> ones like self-esteem and confidence building, but particularly for some of our young people who come from seriously deprived backgrounds, we've seen massive changes in their, their outcomes. Um, so for us, it's a really important part of the Twin City programme, the educational exchanges, absolutely. Um, as Gillian says, I think um, engaging people um, at a very young age in those established relations where you have in both cities almost a protective framework because you have your equivalents who know exactly what to do when these people land in the city, how to be taken care of, but also how to really um, look at the opportunities that could take place during that short visit, it, it can be absolutely life-changing. Um, and um, I have to say there's a huge amount of interest from cities uh, to engage with us in, in schools. Um, if it can't be done through schools, though sometimes it can be done through youth groups and sports and other areas of youth activity, um, and even in employability programmes as well, I think it's an area that we're very keen to look at. So I would absolutely endorse that. does uh, the panel think it might have in encouraging um, children to learn more languages or is it assist or is it makes Jill. no real difference Gillian it would make a huge difference yeah to put it bluntly it would make a huge difference I mean our, our partners our European partners in particular um, one of our most successful twin city partnerships has been with Nuremberg um, and that's never an issue, the language, because our German colleagues speak very good English. Our French partners, Marseille, prefer to speak French, so it can be more of an issue. Our Italian partners are the same, they prefer to speak Italian. Um, I think that some of the cultural exchange is missing when our young people don't have the language. Um, certainly young people always find something in common to communicate with each other, so they always manage to get on and find something that they can, they can, they can communicate. But... We do try very hard if our young people are going out. 
to have a very, very basic grounding in the language, even if it's just, hello, how are you, my name is, all of that. But it would make a big, big difference, yeah, if we could encourage more language learning in schools. Okay, Ellie. The, some of the European funded programmes do encourage that element of um, learning languages. We um, had some funding under the European Leonardo programme for a, a short um, exchange programme between economic development officers in Edinburgh and economic development officers in our twin city, Munich. Um, so it was a very small grant, but it was enough to allow six people each way to spend two weeks with their colleagues um, in, in the other departments. And as part of that, they had to undertake um, a period of language learning. So it, you know, it wouldn't have been advanced German, but it was enough to be able to um, land with confidence, I think, um, and everybody um, enjoyed that, and many of them have continued to, to, to work on the language. So that was a good example of European-funded support for that kind of initiative. Excellent. Um, Jamie? I was just going to come in just on the supplement. I noticed from the evidence that the Bavarian uh, thing had said that their natural sort of... Um, friendly countries, if you like, were the Czech Republic, Austria and Switzerland, um, which presumably sort of goes back in history to the sort of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, I, I just wondered what would, you know, from the local authorities' point of view, how do you work out who to twin with? And um, wh wh who are the natural... I'm taking England out of the equation for the time being. Um, who, who are the natural neighbours for, for, for Scotland, really? I knew. Uh, very, very quickly, I mean, at a European level, there is um, an, a structure available through the CEMR, uh, Council for European Municipalities and Regions, which acts as a matchmaking arrangement, and it actually lists it, um, what the different partners are offering and what they're looking for in a almost online dating arrangement. So um, there, there are some materials available for people who are um, proactively looking and, and wish to form those links and wish to see people who can benefit. Some of that, though, is perhaps more targeted nowadays at the international development range of the spectrum, for which there's a slightly different culture in mainland Europe, with local authorities um, more often having direct access to funding for this sort of work on a continual basis that in, helps ensure long-term relationships with uh, twinning uh, arrangements and also the transfer of skills and knowledge between um, local authorities who are often at the vanguard of uh, developmental work. But that, that's just the formal sort of EU. That's helpful. Um, oh, um, back on to the point about uh, the, the language learning. It certainly is um, invaluable. Uh, throughout our evidence, we've got several examples of uh, educational exchanges for languages, but also with skills. And I'd just like to add on that, that, going back to a previous point, I think it's these types of exchanges and Erasmus, etc., are a great opportunity to introduce the European Union to young people at an early age, the, the, benefit, uh, uh, the benefits that it can bring. And I think if we get, you know, if we can um, explain this, you know, what the European does, the European Union does, and the, the benefits it brings to these young people at this age would be, I think we'd set them up with but perhaps a little less of a, an ingrained Euroscepticism that maybe perhaps some older people might have. <laughs> OK. Um, new line of questioning from Anne McTaggart. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I'm not really sure who I'm aiming this one to, but do we use um, some of our successful entrepreneurs, some of our success stories um, that have happened with European funding, do we use some of those individuals have we created a mentoring scheme that's, that's able to be tapped into? I'm not sure, sorry, convener, who, that, who best to answer. I don't think we have. Malcolm. Perhaps, but, perhaps answer in part. <laughs> so, but I think you're right. Uh, what actually makes things much more uh, real for people when they're perhaps thinking of uh, uh, entering into the, 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 the thickets of European funding, for example, is good case studies. So good examples, uh, people who, so I think whether it's uh, on the sort of business innovation side and obviously uh, uh, Elaine already referred to an excellent project that Edinburgh City Council led uh, on inspiring open innovation on that. So it's getting uh, 
whether it's, about, whether it's in the field of education, as also has been talked about, whether it's in the field of uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, getting sort of role models, getting good case studies, I think is absolutely the right way of trying to get that uh, the positive benefits of European and international engagement across to people in a way that's much more real, uh, much more real to them than even the best website or, or, or Facebook page or whatever. Uh, I think that's a, you know a, a very important one. We need. You know, things like I say, the funding portal are excellent in terms of following a skeleton, but uh, it's the personal examples or the organisational examples that give the flesh to that uh, to that body. Um, oh, maybe oh, yeah. just to add that, not necessarily within the EU context, but working with businesses and entrepreneurs in the city on our international projects and um, obviously helping us pool resources, perhaps offering the opportunity to use premises um, when we have international delegations coming into the city, but also taking part to help showcase the city internationally, not necessarily for an export reason, but to showcase the technology that we have in the city or to showcase strength of financial services. So we do work very closely with the different sectors in the city and um, you know they'll often come alongside us and um, talk about the benefits of that public private partnership working back to you Anne yeah I think that's me um, really and just really to agree with you convener it is um, much better if we could see one of Joanne's suggestions coming to fruition um, about visualising how we market, wh what we actually do and how many countries we do that in, it's far easier. Yeah, thank you. Adam. Okay, can, convener, I think uh, I'd like to just ask one question and that is how, what one thing do you think could uh, improve our engagement internationally uh, from your perspective? Sorry. Learning. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one for me. Yeah, language learning, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Juan? Um, I would agree that languages are hugely important. Um, also, sharing knowledge about what each of us are, are doing. Uh, as I said before, you know, there were some great case studies in here um, that I wasn't aware of before. So, sharing this knowledge and perhaps collaborating more, working together. Malcolm. Oh, not second, well, third of the issue with the languages. Uh, one of the things, is because of our general less sophisticated level of language skills overall compared with other countries, it kind of sometimes limits our sort of pool of potential partners. You know, you're pulled to sort of Scandinavia, the Netherlands, Northern Europe, so because by and large, as uh, uh, Julian mentioned, that, you know, the language skills issue is not never been an issue with the link, the long-standing link Glasgow's had with Nuremberg. But in a sense, you know, we shouldn't just expect everyone to be able to, uh, to conduct their business discussions purely in English. So the one thing that would actually unlock much more potential is a much broader base of, of, of language skills within, uh, within Scottish organisations and Scottish communities. Anyway. I'd reflect on Joanne's point about uh, information exchange understanding better how different cultures approach similar problems to those we have, um, to which end we um, often are involved in encouraging exchanges uh, at a local authority association level. So we have delegations coming to visit us and also member authorities. Uh, again, largely Scandinavian, but we've had Finnish tax experts looking at council tax and providing input into the uh, Commission on Local Financing. We've had uh, submissions from Danish, uh, Dutch, and um, I can't remember who else on our uh, Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy. The Icelandic people come and sort of feel a little bit sorry that they're not quite in the European Union, but very affected by it. And it also is a salutary lesson to what might happen if you are just going to be a passive member of the European regulatory environment. Um, we've also had the Congress uh, and its monitoring report last year providing uh, an overview about how well we comply with the European Charter on Local Self-Government, and you're probably aware there's still work to be done. Um, those sorts of things are very important, I think, in preventing one from being so insular and also learning and, and giving strangely examples, obviously, to the other um, member states of the European Union about how we work here. Our community planning partnership arrangements are probably further advanced 
uh, than in many other countries, but a lot of people now moving in that way slowly. So it's a two-way process. Well, um, I'd go for um, building up those niche opportunities that we have as distinct um, <coughs> local authority, you know, areas, regions, you know, really playing to our strengths and looking to see what we at local level can bring to the, the, the Scottish um, strategy agenda. So um, all of us have particular areas that we could contribute um, towards. And I think having more awareness of those and building those into the early engagement um, and the relationship building at, at governmental level would um, stand us in good stead in terms of the delivery of the strategies. Does that answer your question, Adam? It does indeed, thank you. <laughs> Is there any other questions from members? Any other points that are panel would like to make? Uh, I would like to make a that is um, talking about uh, how um, twinning cities are decided upon. I think one of the things that uh, has, has uh, not been mentioned is the councillors' participation in the twinning process. Uh, I've gone through the process of a couple of twinnings myself as a councillor, and I know that sometimes the twinnings uh, are actually driven by either the Lord Provost or the Chair of Development Regeneration Services uh, Committee, uh, and between them um, they come up with uh, a twinning um, suggestion because of various reasons. Either we have commercial links or cultural links or we have a diaspora that is in such a, a large number that it is their wish that that happens. So there are a number of issues why some, some of the international twinnings take place. But I think the important element in all of this is if and when a twinning does take place, it shouldn't be that you sign a twinning and then you, you put the forms away and you forget about it. The, twin, the whole point of a twinning is to make it work, and I think that's the important uh, element in any twinning that we take part in, whether it be international or European. And I think um, we would we benefit from that if we, if, we, if you go down that process. I went to one particular twin city, which was Cuba, and I was I was shocked that they had over 50 twin cities. And I said to myself, how in heaven do they keep track of all these twinnings, and how do they work with them? Uh, so, you know, sometimes you can be uh, overzealous and just have far too many. And I understand because Cuba was isolated for a period of time and countries wanted them to feel that they were part and parcel of the human race. But, I mean, I'm talking about just generally speaking, twinnings I think need to be limited so that they're, they're manageable and also that they're effective. I think that's important as well. Gillian. To respond to um, Councillor Mal or um, Mr. Malik, yeah, um, call me Malik. You're right. Right. <laughs> um, certainly our own, our own twin cities that we'll get eight of, there were a myriad of reasons for twinning with those cities, but we try really hard to make sure that they're all included in our twin city programme. I think now that in some circles, twinning is regarded as a bit old fashioned, I suppose. So what we've tried to see now is we're, for example, our projects with South Africa, we are forming a technical partnership with these municipalities for the duration of this project. And when that technical partnership comes to its natural end, we'll look at it again. Um, so I, th I think the notion of twinning is still very important. Elaine. Uh, just, just to add to that, I mean, our twinning relationship with Munich is 60 years old and our twinning with Florence is 50 years old. And um, this, um, we, we have a range of projects happening with those cities and have had ever since the first uh, day. Um, but it, it's hard work to keep these relationships going with um, you know, limited resources. So it takes a lot of time and patience and it's about um, building capacity across the sectors and different you know, uh, relationships within the cities as well as across. Um, but you know, we have very many um, partnerships for European funded projects and for other distinct pieces of work, you know, technical partnerships, as Gillian says. So the twin cities that are active and are dynamic and are mutually wishing to continue that relationship, it, it's perfect relationship. But there are many others that are project-based um, and which um, also you can bring new things into the twinnings that exist, perhaps from the experience you've had in working in other partnership arrangements. So it, it evolves all the time. And I think, um, as you say, Mr. Malik, it's keeping them very much alive um, and also being able to you know, evaluate them. That's tricky, but there are certain ways you can in terms of the level of engagement that you get across um, both of those cities. Comment from Malcolm? Yeah, 
thank you. I mean, just to sort of bring, draw attention to what I sort of rounded off my written evidence with, and it uh, echoes directly a point that Mr. Malik made. Commitment by senior management and by elected members, whether they're at the, in this forum here in the Scottish Parliament or in local authorities, is absolutely critical to making a success of European international work. It is from the discretionary part of local government. We have no statutory obligation to do twinning or engage in European projects. At a time, of course, when budgets are under severe pressure, senior management and elected member support is absolutely critical to making these things actually happen on the ground in realistic terms, as, uh, again, as, uh, as Mr Malik uh, said in his remarks. Okay. On that point of information, very good information at that. Can I thank you all for uh, giving up your time and, and your energy, your written evidence and your oral evidence today. It's been extremely helpful and I hope you'll keep track of the inquiry. Um, we'll be looking for some visual aids, I think, to, to, to help us along. But thank you very much for, for coming along to committee this morning. I'm going to take a brief suspension just to allow us to change over and get a quick break. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to the European External Relations Committee. We are moving on now to agenda item three, which is uh, consideration of a draft annual report. You have it in your papers. I'm happy to go through it page by page if uh, members are content with that. So page one is the general introduction. Any issues with page one? That's paragraphs one to six. Willie. Yeah, can I just offer a comment? I mean, it's good. It's a good, uh, good summary of uh, what we, we did. Um, it maybe could be enhanced a wee bit if we included some of the, the issues of concern to the committee during the year. 
It reads more of a statement of what we did um, rather than what we felt about certain issues like broadband, like small business expansion, stuff like that. The issues that arose at the committee and under discussion might be worthy as a, just a little footnote to, to round it off, I thought. Um, yeah, the sort of a standard uh, report is just a reflection of what's, what's happened at committee. So. Yeah, but it's all right. If that's what it could be, <laughs> but I'm suggesting it could be enhanced and made better by doing that. Yeah. If the public want to read this and find out what the committee was doing, it's fine. But what did we discuss and what were the issues of concern to us? And There's a bit of discussion going on with the conveners group on the format of the reports and things, so okay. that's an ongoing piece of work. So um, this is what we've got right now. <laughs> Any other questions or comments on page one? No. Page two is paragraph seven to ten. Page 3 is 11 to 14. No. Nope. Then the next page is paragraph 15 to 18. With a lovely photograph of Hans Alla at Royal Ballet. Just in case anybody missed it. He's not wearing a tutu. <laughs> um, and the final page is just for meetings. Paragraph 19. Are you content to... Um, publish the annual report. Okay, excellent. Moving on to agenda item four, which is the Brussels Bulletin. Um, we consider this in the usual manner. So, any questions, clarifications? Rod. Questions, more of a comment, really, of quite interesting um, bit on renewable energy, saying how well Bulgaria, Estonia, Lithuania, Romania, and Sweden were doing, but. Um, France, Germany and the UK not doing very well, although uh, obviously Scotland's in a slightly different position, but um, uh, indicates that uh, those targets might be quite difficult, um, unless there's a marked improvement. Okay. Anything else? Can, um, I, can I ask about page eight? It's in the health and sports alcohol. On the 28th of April, the European Parliament adopted um, and launched a new alcohol strategy to enter force in 2016. Have we seen sight of that, or can we get a copy of that sent over? We can get a copy of it, yep. Yeah. It actually ties in very closely to the Scottish Government's priorities on That's what I was thinking, and how that impacts and, yeah. on the alcohol strategy that we are... Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. We can get that. Willie Coffee. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, could I just raise again the digital single market comment on page four there? I, I have to say how underwhelmed I am <laughs> to read the 16-point the plan there to advance the whole digital economy. I mean, the, the issues there are all, I'm pretty sure they're all fairly worthy, whatever some of them actually are, like ending unjustified geo-blocking. I'm sure we'd be delighted to find out what on earth that is. Um, but I just think that they've they haven't really got their eye on the big issues, as far as I'm concerned, that might interest customers throughout the European Union about digital technology, mobile services, broadband, all of that. For example, why are they not thinking about moving to a single EU tariff for mobiles, for example? Things like that. Why are they not thinking about a race to the top for super-fast broadband so that the infrastructure is as good as the best member of the European Union, rather than everybody doing their own thing. And, and why are they not thinking about open up, opening up access for customers in Europe to digital service providers right across Europe? We, we're kind of locked in in our mem in particular member state and buying services from companies within that member state. And sh surely they can have issues should be of interest to people right across the European Union. So these things being, being worthy as they are, I have no idea who decided that these are the priorities for the digital agenda, agenda in Europe. And I, I don't know where we go with this as a committee convener. We've raised it so many times. Perhaps we could speak to somebody who's influential about setting up this kind of strategy and why it came to be what it is. Because I'm pretty certain if you sat this down in front of ordinary folk, they would give you a different set of priorities than this. It's a commissioner for the digital single market, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could investigate. 
who the commissioner is and Chair, um, when, if and when we ever get to visit Brussels, um, could we possibly seek a meeting then? Absolutely. Because it is a priority for us. Yeah. We can do something with the European Parliament when we're in Strasbourg in yeah. October. Yes, yeah. I think we should be, maybe that should be one of the things we want to be doing. Yeah. Yeah. You can lead on that. Chief Convener, we, we won't drive this agenda, but no. somebody's driving it, and I'd like to find out who it is and why they came up with this okay. set of 16 points, which are interesting, but they're not really the crucial issues for me. You know. But Convener, also, I think it's important that they, re they appreciate that this is an issue for us and it is an, a, a priority for us as well. So next time when they make these decisions, they'll, they'll hopefully remember that we had an issue with it. Yep. Okay, anything else in the Brussels Bulletin? Content to make it available to other committees for the perusal? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, that, Jimmy. I wondered if the, um, the stuff they're doing about school milk and that sort of thing was, it was intended to help the dairy crisis in any, any way, if, if it's linked to that or not. Was this the dairy milk plan? Yes. That, that was, there was some information about that a few weeks ago, wasn't yeah. there? We can certainly have a look at that and get you some more information, Jamie. I just, I just wondered. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just at a time when the local authority in my area have withdrawn free school milk, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested in that, well, absolutely. <laughs> the dairy industry needs help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that concludes all of our business for today. Our next meeting um, is an informal meeting with the international development sector on the 20th. 1st of May and I now close this meeting. If members could stay in their seats for a few seconds just for a quick update at the end of the meeting, I would appreciate that. But I now close the meeting. Thank you very much.